we're back at Granite City Comic Con, and thank you guys for giving it the time. No bother. Jim Alexander, Monty Nero. Anytime. Is that your real name? No. Okay, because I kept mentioning it <coughs> when I was I was mentioning getting ready for the interview before when Eurovision was on, and my girlfriend kept thinking I was saying Montenegro. Oh, yeah, and she was people, thinking, people uh, originally it was all one word, well, which is the way it is on my creator own comic Montenegro. Um, but then no one, everyone thought it was Montenegro. So eventually, <laughs> like when I started doing stuff for Marvel, they split it up into two words. So then yeah. it became Monty and then Nero. So then it's like a name, just like a name, like Monty. Whatever. And do you cool. feel it's not as special now? It's just Monty. No, I'm quite happy. Yeah, it's quite nice actually having the Marvel stuff with sort of a slightly different name. <laughs> <laughs> keeps keeps the creator own stuff pure. Pure, exactly. <laughs> Was it not uh, to disguise uh, your, from your dad to keep it hidden? From My criminal your dad, past. Uh, yeah. Mm. You don't want your dad to know that you did comic books. Well, part of the reason was uh, <laughs> when I started doing comic books, I was like working full time as a computer game artist. And I didn't want them to know that I was doing a lot of, a lot of work <laughs> on comics <laughs> in my spare time. Cause, yeah, because you were on, you did work on APB, didn't you? Yeah, I did uh, lots of games um, going way back uh, into the nineties. Um, did stuff for like uh, Sega Saturn. That was my first Sega first game stuff oh. and uh, PlayStation. And then all the way through, since then, I've been doing games like Roll Cage was a good racing game for Psygnosis that I did back in the day. Yeah, yeah. And um, then I eventually went to Electronic Arts and did Need for Speed and uh, the SSX. SSX? Yeah. And um, that's when I started getting into real character design. Yeah. And you can see the sort of same sort of style of characters I was on say, the because, SSX yeah. games sort of carried Because in Death Sentence, you, you do like character profiles essentially yeah, with the character designs. Character. Yeah, so yeah. it's a similar sensibility. I've just been sort of developing it since then, really. Oh. And um, try and get my own style going. Mm. That's the plan. Getting the whole process. Yeah. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one day. <laughs> Um, I was well. Uh, thanks for giving us time, you know, no just to talk to you guys. I say, it surprised by how busy. I think everyone's yeah, it's it's intense uh, out there. It's yeah, no, it's good to see that there's lots of people who want to come. I know exactly. Yeah. There, there oh, were queue. Lots of people want to queue. <laughs> it's just a queue simulator. <laughs> <laughs> but they were. Uh, we were saying we were talking to the guys in the door, and uh, Colin was saying, "Oh, it's great. It's an amazing turnout. As long as they only come in and." two hours at a time <laughs> fine then we can just let everyone in yeah it's the only comic kind of into where they're asking people to leave <laughs> <laughs> yeah you've had your fun yeah. now, have you experienced off. the whole convention <laughs> um, go, it's just like a through I've line a good look around before the doors open it nah, look, look pretty cool nah, I've, no, I've no idea mm. <laughs> it's, it's a good, another place it's a good venue but I guess it'll need to be bigger next year so. oh yeah I was going to say it's, it's really bizarre going to see a vendor and then there's a massive climbing wall area yeah like, just <laughs> I quite like that it's got a nice like, post-apocalyptic feel yeah. ice hockey thing as well you know just to get rid of your yeah you know your tension you can yeah, shoot exactly. Judge Dredd here or something yeah um, or some judges here maybe if they use yeah. the hotel as well next time or something yeah. spread it out over spread a few it out venues over the whole city <laughs> yeah. yeah but um, yeah one of the the running themes that uh, when we were talking to the guys that organised this they were talking about the small press side of things and creator owned mm-hmm. being, you know wanting to push that with this and uh, put that on display and both of you guys, obviously, with Planet uh, Jimbot, and as far as you know, your own Death Sentence stuff as mm-hmm. well. Like that's stuff that you guys are really, you know, really well known for. You've done work for, you know, the like Marvel, DC, and things. But it's as far as creator owned and small press has gone. It's there's, it's never been a better time, really. No, it's true. That sort yeah, of and a lot of it's now beginning to feed through. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's uh, obviously the people. Um, all, all names escape me, but uh, uh, John Lee's is having a bit of success with. Um, and now Emily's gone. Uh, yeah. T- uh, oh, what is it? What's the company called? Uh, based in the States. Uh, it'll come to me eventually in about three hours' time. <laughs> I got up at half past four this morning so I could be at Aberdeen <laughs> for like nine o'clock, so I'm quite frazzled. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of it feeding through now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think these days, it's, it's the bars changed. It used to be when we first started, uh, just read the magazine all those years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would uh, submit a synopsis, and then they would get back to you. And you would submit a script, and then the next thing you would know about it would be like six months, eight months down the line when actually yeah. being drawn. These days now, um, you know, uh, we've got so much more uh, creative control. Mm-hmm. 
uh, of these things and that you're taking a project and you're pushing it um, as much as you can through the independent side mm-hmm. of things and then hopefully um, you know we've had some success other publishers coming in and picking up yeah. uh, the titles I mean the ma- major difference from that is it's a finished product so from their point of view um, a lot of the you know, the, oh, well, the light, it's there it's there so you either like it or you don't there's no kind of like you know any speculation it should yeah. make it easier for publishers to mm-hmm. To, to pick these things up. Yeah. How has it been uh, managing your own, sort of like managing your own essentially with the Planet Gym bot? Because I, I assume if it's small presses, a lot of it, you're working with people who, may, it may not be their full time job. Yes. Uh-huh. Comics. Yeah. Because um, you've uh-huh. kept quite a steady flow of stuff coming out as well. Yeah. It's um, impressive. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that means a lot coming from you. Um, sincerely. But uh, yes, um, I, it's it, we go to a lot of conventions and there's a there's a lot of uh, artists there, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think these days artists is looking to, to get involved in a, a project. Mm-hmm. I think for them to get noticed these days, um, it's much more difficult now to um, get in touch with uh, editors uh, or, or have that. Uh, one-to-one with uh, publishers you really yeah. need to have some kind of project behind you mm-hmm. so um we've we've had people at luke cooper have worked in uh, um, uh good cop bad cop mm-hmm. will pickering as well who um is working um as far as planet gym bot's concerned full time in world country mm-hmm. and uh hopefully it's it's boosting their profile yeah as well as mine and the, the companies so yeah it's just a case of uh you know always putting stuff out new you. you just feel that it's just it's like the Ouroboros, it's the snake feeding the snake, yeah, it's just, uh, just to keep um, moving things along. Mm-hmm. So um, from that from that, that way, you know, it's been, been really good. Mm-hmm. I see creator-owned comics more as um, like the end game rather than a sort of stepping stone to something else. Yeah. Um, it was a real surprise to me when like, Marvel got in touch and asked me to write a few things. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really... The point. It wasn't objective. Yeah. No. The point from my point of view was I'd spent my life doing all these creative things for other people, and um, you know it's satisfying. But at the same time, it's never your own thing, or it's never mm-hmm. exactly as you wanted it to be. And you always, I often felt like things could have been, you know, better. Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to just sort of see if that's true or not. You know, if you do something that's purely the way you want it to be, yeah. is it going to work? You know, and um, just really, really wanted to do something where. Mm-hmm. It, didn't have any meetings with anybody about anything, just did it exactly the way we wanted. So that was the motivation. Mm. Is that what Death Sentence was to you? Yeah, that's what Death Sentence was to me. So it's a very sort of personal sort of project. And then um, I sort of didn't expect it to be financially successful. Mm -hmm. But when it was... And just, I was just like, well, this, you know, why would I want to do anything else? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, you can do make money doing what you want to do. Mm-hmm. So the way you, know, you want that's, to do that's it. me sorted. You know, I'll happily do that for the next forty years if people keep buying it. Yeah. So um, you know, it obviously depends on the audience. If the audience, um, you know, keeps keeps uh, building or, or doesn't die off, mm-hmm. then I'm just going to keep making them. So death sentence is like my main thing. Yeah. And then anything else that I'm doing. Um, like I'm doing a Vertigo series at the moment, mm-hmm. but it has to be like something that can not affect like my main Your own my stuff, main work. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So um, that's the way I see it. And I think in the old days, I don't know what you think, but it used to be like people that people wanted to get the, the idea of having their own creator own series mm-hmm. was like a dream for people. Mm-hmm. You know, they do all this work for Marvel or whatever, and they'd think like, oh, if only I own own the uh, my own characters and yeah. stuff like that. So so the fact that you can you know, by a lot of good fortune, you know, you can sort of do your own creator, th- creator own thing and it's successful and then you can sort of actually make a living from it. Yeah. It's an amazing, an amazing thing for everybody it's great to have in the business. Yeah. You know, it's a great, it's a great, great uh, opportunity for, for mm-hmm. everybody to sort of um, try and do that. Yeah. Um, though I guess, inevitably, the more comics there are, the harder it gets for everybody. Mm-hmm. So it's very easy, it's very easy to sort of make your own comic. Um, it's just uh, the financial side of it is more tricky. Yeah, trying to trying to earn a living from it is a hard bit. Because mm-hmm. uh, was it Alan Grant? Alan Grant was saying in here when he was in here before that um, it used to be he'd get a check and then on the back of the check was essentially what he'd have to sign. Yeah, and that was essentially the contract. Yeah, like, that you know this was the this was the rights to this story, this character, and so yeah, on. yeah, it's a really 
it's really odd think of that. It's like, here's your money, but you have to do this in order yeah. to get this. Yeah. Well, um, that's the way things was. It was a very different world. Um, now, I think um, it's a little bit more transparent. And uh, it's almost... Uh, in some ways, I think it got, it's gone a little bit too far the other way. And like mm-hmm. people, a lot of people um, don't really recognise the contribution that the publisher makes. Yeah, if you're a big publisher and you can get a comic in every comic shop in the world, mm-hmm. and you're a really respected publisher, and you know people are waiting to buy something that comes out from that publisher. Yeah, that's actually a very positive thing for mm-hmm. a creator because it means you can maybe sell like you know ten times more than yeah. you'd sell on your own. Mm-hmm. So I, I think you've got to recognise that is valuable. And that's worth something. So, yeah. you know, I think what I think is that have a fair share of the rights, you know. Yeah. So it's not like the publisher gets most of the rights and you get a tiny, tiny percentage mm-hmm. of something. Uh, I think it's, you know, we're all contributing something. So let's let's have an equal share. Equal share. That's, like that's always it. the way I've approached mm-hmm. deals with companies and stuff. No, I, I, I think it's been great seeing all this creator-owned stuff just because... It's it's really diverse to see this stuff now. It's not just a superhero book kind of thing, or it's not just you know the. There's a lot of interesting ideas, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, people are freed up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's one of the great things about creator owned is, as Jim was saying, it's just you and your artist. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you've got an idea and you're doing the whole package, so you can get a real vision and a real sort of flavor and a unique sort of tone to the whole yeah. thing because you're in charge of the whole thing. Um, when you're writing stuff for companies, it's sort of like you do the script, but you're not in charge of getting the art ready. So the yeah. art might come back in sort of ways that you weren't expecting. Mm-hmm. And then somebody else letters it and they maybe aren't totally on board with the sort of yeah. overall program. And by the time you see it back, you're like, well, this isn't really what I wrote. <laughs> and then often you rewrite it at that point to sort of make yeah. sense of what's been done. And it ends up, you know, it might be good, but it's not the sort of vision that you had when you started. Mm-hmm. So I think the great thing about Creator Owned is you can sort of create something with a very, very unique and complete yeah. sort of flavor. And, and uh, put more of yourself into it. Yeah, yeah, put more of yourself into it, and it's a lot more satisfying. I find. Yeah, I think essentially it's uh, it's it's all collaborative, and that's mm. what it boils down to. And uh, if you've got more people, if you you're working with uh, you know companies mm-hmm. uh, like Dark Horse or uh, you know Marvel DC, then there's obviously more people that have got a say in it. Mm-hmm. But o- obviously, um, it, it works both ways. I mean, I, I did a, a Penguins of Madagascar uh, story for Titan. Uh, the, the the turn of the year, and that was a case of yeah, it was a work for hire, and, and so long as you, you you accept that, I mean they're they're paying for you to to mm-hmm. do a service, then uh, it, it's it's a healthy mix. Yeah. But certainly, if you're a writer, um, you you should be able to accommodate both the mm-hmm. the kind of creator owned and the the work for hire, yeah. uh, and, and it's different demands, but essentially it's still it's putting a comic out mm-hmm. to what 20 pages uh making sure that uh your uh, script can be understood by the artist mm-hmm. and then obviously it's still being involved and in the I, I think these days even publishers will use the writer um and more steps mm-hmm. uh, it's not just a case of submitting the script yeah and you will from there. get a chance to 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 have a have a say in all the the processes mm-hmm. One one thing uh, I've noticed with um, a lot of, depending what the the nature of, say, the Penguins, Madagascar thing was, it needed to be out. Uh, it was like I did the first draft of the script just before Thought Bubble, which was November. Mm-hmm. And oh, it was awesome. out, it was actually released in the States, a uh, full colour comic. Uh, it was released in the States for uh, the end of January. Mm-hmm. So you are talking uh, a massive turnaround yeah. really quick. Whereas, <laughs> obviously, you know, some of the stuff that we work on, uh, Planet Jimbot, can take quite a long gestation period mm-hmm. before it comes out. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the other good things about Create Around is uh, you can do that. You sort of plan a long way ahead. And uh, it always annoys me when you're into a comic and then the artist changes or something. Yeah. Well, before we... Um, you know, started printing Death Sentence. I mean, we basically had every issue finished, more or less. Mm-hmm. I think it was, uh, we were a long way ahead. And with the new series that starts, comes out in two weeks. Yeah, Death you're in Aberdeen in, the, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, Asylum you? Comics. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing a signing there on the 13th all day. Mm-hmm. So that's um, Death Sentence London number one, which is a new story um, mm-hmm. set in the same sort of universe. Um, uh, with that, the artist has already finished the fifth issue. So, you know, you know that when you yeah. buy it every month, it's going to be it's like gonna consistent, be regular and consistent and regular and mm. it's not going to be sort of any sort of rush jobs or filling artists or anything. And it just makes you 
you can get more a sort of a, a better sort of more cohesive world. Yeah, and it's a lot more satisfying for everybody. I think um, yeah. doing it that way because it can be kind of jarring if you're just switching, if, especially if the art's not really very similar and you just jump to the next sort of page. It's yeah, this one th- you know through line story, but then visually it just changes. Yeah, I don't. I'm not, I don't really understand why it always happens because mm. you know you'd think like okay I understand that you know there's deadlines but surely if you just you just all worked like six months ahead then, <laughs> then this wouldn't need to happen quite so much but I guess it's a more of a short term profit led business mm. so um, things are always happening very fast mm-hmm. with uh, a lot of the bigger companies yeah I think uh, if it's a project and I'm just talking generally um, and it's uh, writer led a uh, little lot of the vertical books, um, then the so the writers the the keys of part of it, so mm-hmm. you can accommodate, you know, the changes of artists, mm-hmm. um, a wee bit more. And I think so long as that you still get that theme and that thread mm-hmm. coming through. Uh, we, we interestingly enough, with Wolf Country, uh, the first issue was done by Luke Cooper, and then he went on to do uh, Good Cop Bad Cop, mm-hmm. and then Will Pickering came in, and he's got a very different style. But I think it works in, in in the sense of you got the first issue and you get the first two, so you've seen the. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it annoyed you. Did it annoy you intensely? Oh, I didn't know. But uh, again, it helped with the fact that, that the first uh, issue of it's a self-contained story anyway, and it's a very personal story. I mean, mm-hmm. two two characters uh, fall down a pit and and talk a lot, and uh, and then the second issue sort of like starts building the the, the, the kind of like the the background, the, mm-hmm. the mythology. <laughs> Uh, attached to the the actual uh, story and, and Will I've been lucky enough to uh, Will's continued uh, we're waiting for issue 4 to come back from the printers so I mean yeah, yeah I always get an eye for uh, uh, something like that you know uh, having some kind of conti- continuity mm-hmm. uh, with the art but of course uh, a lot of the, the creator own stuff as well you do tend to uh, want to limit yourself to maybe 3-4 issues more mm-hmm. at the most so in that way you hope that the artist still yeah. Um, stay on board unless you get snaffled by DC or Marvel. Mm. I mean, there's not much you can do about that. <laughs> but it's, uh, Image are doing that quite a lot right now with their six issue arcs, things yeah. along that sort of line, because I think they plan on releasing them as books. Yeah, as they're much more interested in the book mm-hmm. market these days. They just made that announcement, didn't they, that they're going to stop doing variant covers for comics, but they're going to start doing them for trades. So when they do a book, they're going to have like a shop that has its own unique cover or something to. Try oh, sort of like exclusives. Up, yeah, try and drive up sales for the books. Well, Titan think, do that with Doctor Who, don't they? They've got uh, they got they've got mass cover mass specific. Oh yeah, for, for the books, various different Forbidden Planet stores and that. If you if you get a, a a Doctor Who comic, it'll show you all the kind of different. And number one, uh, the Peter Capaldi one, uh, I had like about I don't know forty, fifty variant covers. <laughs> Honestly, that, that <laughs> that's much. on the comic though, isn't it? This is like, they're starting to do it for the books now. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Exclusively. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you get a Nobles one for the States, you'll have a... Yeah. Some of them mm. are, are just a variation of a theme, but some mm. of them are genuinely... Uh, that, that must have been a, yeah. a monstrous uh, task, yeah. task yeah, for somebody. They'll probably be cowering in some yeah. corner as they speak, <laughs> chewing, in their, chewing in their pillow or something like that. I but, used to uh, be a man. <laughs> <laughs> like all these covers. That's just for issue one. So uh, it's interesting. I mean, again, it's sort of like... Um, uh, you know, the, the the situation with just trying to generate interest. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, even when you do a collection, you know, you're looking to have a different cover. Yeah. It's just to sort of like give that illusion of this is something new, mm-hmm. even though it's not. <laughs> <laughs> even though it's been done. This one is so much shinier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shiny covers is uh, always good. Yeah. It's in a bit of a difficult place, the comic business at the moment, because um, a lot of people wait mm-hmm. to buy the book. Yeah. Which you can understand from a sort of consumer point of view and I do that sometimes mm-hmm. um, but at the same time the comic only exists because people bought the single issues yeah so if people don't buy the single issues then there won't be a book mm-hmm. um, and it's not it's sort of in a transition phase there might eventually be a case where you can you know just go straight to putting yeah. stuff out as books and there'll be enough people to buy it to make it mm-hmm. worthwhile so it's like a pilot comic yeah, mm-hmm. but um, but at the moment it's in this sort of weird sort of half world where it's neither one nor the other. It's, it's, it's quite tricky, and it's really difficult trying to explain to people. It's like you know that if you don't buy the single issues, then this there won't happen. be a book <laughs> exactly <laughs> because no, you know there's n- there's no there's no sort of 
it's not gonna it's not gonna work financially. So yeah, yeah. I was Plus, at Eisner's. I was at Eisner's and uh, a few. You years were at ago, Will Eisner's. Uh, well, Eisner's. <laughs> it's uh, a hangout together. It was a sailing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Frank Frank Miller came on board. Uh, came came. He on board. was in a seance too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, Frank Miller was there, and he had a, a comic book. A lot put up above his head, and he said, "This is, see these pamphlets. It's the end of pamphlets, which was rather shocking. Uh, bas- basically, his idea was, no, we're not going to do comic books anymore. We're just going to do book books, and uh, it was quite a shocking thing to say. Uh, there's always going to be Frank, uh, Frank Miller. Miller uh, aye, Frank Miller. Aye. I get. <laughs> well, I <laughs> try to put you there guys was, out uh, of money. <laughs> there was myself and I think it was Kev Gunstone that were sitting. I was sitting next to, and we were like, <laughs> obviously that was our livelihood. I love comics, you know. <laughs> so uh, yes, comics. yeah, the floppy comics. You That's know the that whole you point. Can't um, put a hardback, a hardback you can, in your jacket uh, pocket. No, you can, uh, <laughs> not something you can put in a bookcase because it's too floppy. Yeah, I mean the whole point for me was to make a comic, like a series of comics, like episodic monthly fiction. That's right. what I want to do. So there's always been that kind of anti comic book thing yeah but, uh, but, but the independent market's sort of like we're, we're keeping the comic book flying yeah people just want to I think keep it floppy <laughs> <laughs> those kind of people they want to be respectable uh, I've not no interest in being respectable as you can probably tell if yeah. you read Death Sentence right. so, so uh, <laughs> um, I really like one of the things I really like about comics is their sort of underground kind of allure the sort of fact they look like Pulp Fiction and they look a little bit dangerous mm-hmm. well that's and the thing you don't make them grimy anymore it used to be like the, the I old tried ones. to I looked into like printing like old school paper yeah and uh, it was actually more expensive to do that than it is to print still like, have the colour rectangle modern. the top from where it would in have fact, been in fact my first print. my yeah. first mock up that I did of Death Sentence it looked like an old sort of fanzine from sort oh, of the 80s oh, yeah. And I did a really good job of it, but I did it such a good job of it that it literally looked like some shit that you'd never, <laughs> never want to pick up in a million years. <laughs> and I realised that, like, I've gone too far. <laughs> I'm, like, shooting myself in the foot. So it's kind of like a balance between something yeah. that looks like something that you genuinely want to own, but still has that kind of, like, underground kind of feel to it. But does doesn't look like something bad's going to happen if you leave out in the sun for yeah, like two yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get, cheap print, balance. get cheap newsprint. Get cheap newsprint. Uh, really badly, uh, you know, bad, badly coloured and all that. Inks are still running. Just smack it, smack the cover on your <coughs> on your face. cheek. Every, every <laughs> you, you've got a, you've got a tattoo. You've got like a, yeah. a comic page. Free tattoo with every issue <laughs> <laughs> on your thumbs. Uh, yes, I. <laughs> every issue of Death Sentence you uh, personally slammed off your own face. Because <laughs> yeah. these, these glossy things, it's like you're you're terrified of leaving any marks, mm. yeah. any kind of evidence that uh, you've like never been like that. And, uh, All my comics, I've got loads of comics. I've basically, every comic I've ever bought, I've still got in the attic or something. Mm-hmm. But they're, none of them are bagged or anything. It's just all just tossed. I'm the same. They're all in a box. Pick, and yeah, and ordered. I pick them up and read them. And sometimes I used to cut them up and stick them on the wall or whatever. And I think that's the way you should treat comics. You know, it's, it's like it's enjoyed. a portable. Yeah. yeah, it's a portable way of sort of transporting a story. And the fact that it's not permanent is part mm-hmm. of the appeal. I think. And then, you know, nowadays if you want a permanent copy, then you know, buy a really nice hardback version yeah. of it or something. But you've got you've got. Yeah, 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 or the digital version. Well, you try and read your I phone. Don't, I don't <laughs> think digital versions are permanent. I think people are kind of a little bit deluded there because the format will change and mm. everything will change about it. And all the comics you bought digitally, sort of in the last ten years, you won't be able to read them in twenty years' time because there'll be nothing to read them with. Yeah. You know, the, the the technology will be so different. So this doesn't support iOS one million. Yeah, I think a hardback is the best way to sort of have something mm. that you can still read in sort of you know fifty years or something. Yeah. Well, the great thing about comic books is that um, it, it still bucks uh, the, the trend. I mean, I, I was in the, the train uh, the other day, and uh, I was in the furthest away carriage with the, the catering. So I walked through the train, and uh, I was the only person that was wearing, uh, wearing uh, reading the newspaper. I mean, everybody else was reading from their electronic kit and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So obviously that can be on... That cannot be denied, but it's still uh, one of these things where you could buy something and, you know, touch it, feel it, sniff it. Uh, it's still there. It's still something that's... Uh, comic books have, have continued to buck the trend, continued to kind of reinvent themselves. Um, it, it, it's been a great industry to be part of o- over the few years that I've been part of it. Mm. Sales have been going back up, haven't they? 
I, I see. I realized that I wanted to keep with. I struggle with keeping my attention on my phone anyway. But I realized there was a point where I was on my phone for ages, keep hitting the button to keep it lit up, mm. and then I went to my book and I actually looked at my book and put my hand on it. <laughs> was, I was like, this won't, this won't, sh- it. this won't shut down. No, and I was just like, okay, there's something wrong at this point. Yeah. I'm just going to put the phone away. And then yeah, just yeah. Got on reading. It's, yeah. I think I find with me like reading stuff on your device or whatever. It's kind of like complimentary. Mm-hmm. Like I read loads of stuff on my like, phone that I would never pick up as a comic. Mm-hmm. Just sort of like, my, often when I'm waiting in some like, like the hospital or something, I think yeah. half an hour kill, I sort of download a comic that I would never normally buy and sort of mm-hmm. try it out. And if I like it, and I'll go and buy it yeah. like, properly. Um, so I find it, it's almost like... It's a trial. Ext- it's extra sales. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like people read and buy them in a slightly different way. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think it's really damaged um, the sort of market mm-hmm. for pro- like you said, the sales of proper gone. comics, you know, mm-hmm. sort of um, traditional paper comics. It's what we do with the story. It's mm-hmm. what we do with the art. Yeah. Um, good people. comics will, will continue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bad people, I think, I think there'll always be it. comics. There'll always be comics, paper comics. Mm-hmm. Mainly because... If only because like people like me would always want to make them. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think there'll always be a market for comics, and um, some people prophesize otherwise, but I disagree mm-hmm. not on that point. That's, <coughs> a, say, that's a good sort of prophetic way to end. In yes. a very there. Profound, yeah, very <laughs> Yeah, that's me told. <laughs> <laughs> the future is hopeful. Yeah. But thank you very much for the time, guys. Right, Seriously, cheers. I know nice that you're probably you. exhausted. <laughs> so on, but that's just half past four this morning it's all part of our champagne rock and roll lifestyle yeah, oh, I, I, I. <laughs> I'll have dream. a vimto live in the dream, live in the dream with the you've got your carrot cake so. double tree Hilton <laughs> <laughs> <That's it>. indeed <laughs>